Welcome to NTD News. I'm Kevin Hogan. Here are today's top stories. Two states sue President Biden for suspending a Trump-era border policy. They argue Biden's move has caused an influx of crime and human trafficking. U.S. lawmakers disagree over Biden's proposed $2.3 trillion infrastructure plan. The Senate Democratic leader calls for a big, bold agenda, while Republicans call it a massive government expansion that could hurt the economy. But what does Biden say the plan will do for black communities? The Capitol Police Inspector General will testify in Congress this week about the events on January 6th. The New York Times says it's seen a copy of the IG's report, and it details the many mistakes the agency made preparing for events that day. A group of leading Republican senators pushes back against Major League Baseball's swing into politics. They introduce a bill in response. We'll give you the details. New secretly recorded footage of a CNN employee is released by Project Veritas. The employee details the network's alleged plan to support President Biden's campaign and get former President Trump out of office. Two states are suing Biden for suspending Trump's remain in Mexico policy. It required migrants to stay in Mexico to await their immigration cases. The states say Biden should revive the policy to stop the border crisis. Texas and Missouri are suing the Biden administration for suspending the Trump-era Remain in Mexico policy. Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton said dangerous criminals are taking advantage of the lapse in law enforcement and it's resulting in human trafficking, smuggling, a plethora of violent crimes and a massive unprecedented burden on state and federal programs. He said President Biden could reverse all this by reinstating Trump's Remain in Mexico policy. Biden suspended it hours after his inauguration. The lawsuit claims Biden's move has forced the two states to spend a lot more resources to combat human trafficking by drug cartels. The border crisis is also sparking fears of an MS-13 gang resurgence, especially with the surge of unaccompanied minors. A previous surge in 2014 was followed by an uptick in MS-13 violence. It happened in areas where most of the minors were placed. We reached out to the White House for comment, but didn't hear back right away. And Mexico's president expressed concern Tuesday about the surge in human smuggling, especially of minors. Los traficantes de indocumentados, que es una mafia o varias mafias, están utilizando a los niños. Y esto es una gravísima violación de derechos humanos. Officials say human smugglers often advise migrants to bring children with them to take advantage of protections the U.S. gives minors. Mexico's foreign minister also expressed concern. Y la otra cosa que convenimos es tenemos que ir por estos traficantes. Porque esto es algo que no se había presentado en toda la historia. Nunca habíamos visto un tráfico de menores de este tamaño. He says Mexico sent at least 12,000 officials to the southern part of the country. It has 10,000 troops at its southern border to deal with the surge in illegal immigration. A GOP lawmaker wants the U.S. southern border wall to be a symbol of the United States. He's pushing for a new bill designed to protect it. Congressman Madison Cawthorn has introduced what he calls the Donument Act. If passed, the bill would make the wall at the U.S. border with Mexico a national monument. It means it could not be altered. But right now, it's also unfinished. The Defense Department paused construction in January after President Biden signed an executive order. Roughly 450 miles were completed before former President Trump left office. The U.S.-Mexico border stretches over 1,900 miles. President Biden met with members of the Congressional Black Caucus Tuesday. He discussed how his infrastructure plan would help the black community. This, while Republicans criticize the plan for including things that they say don't count as infrastructure. Here are the details. The White House says President Biden's meeting with the Congressional Black Caucus would focus on three things, voting rights, racial equity, and how his infrastructure package will help racial equity. I'd like to take some, spend some time on the American Jobs Act, which I think some of you actually helped me put that together with the ideas you gave me early on. And uh, I think we can make uh, significant, significant changes. In the Oval Office, Biden stressed the importance of economic opportunity for the black community. That's not, it's about income. It's about being able to earn a living. It's about being able to be in a position where you have economic opportunity. 
Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer wants Democrats and Republicans to work together to pass the infrastructure bill. We always want to try to work in a bipartisan way. But we must have a big, bold agenda. And if our Republican colleagues say we will only vote for something that is minuscule and won't do the job, we're not going to be able uh, to get that done. But Republicans do not support Biden's $2.3 trillion infrastructure bill. South Dakota Senator John Thune says the proposal spends more on electric cars than it does on roads, bridges and airports combined. And then you add all the other stuff they have tried to consider into the definition of infrastructure. It is a massive expansion of the government financed on the backs of the American taxpayers with taxes that will hurt the economy and cost us jobs. And 17 Democrats in New York State Assembly said they would not support proposed tax increases to pay for Biden's infrastructure plan unless the plan rolls back a Trump-era tax change that affected high-income earners. President Biden accepted an invitation from House Speaker Nancy Pelosi to address a joint session of Congress on April 28th. That's the night before his 100th day in office. Biden has faced criticism for delaying his first address in contrast to his predecessors. Former President Donald Trump delivered his first speech to Congress on February 28th. That's about two months earlier than Biden. Presidents usually use their first address to celebrate their early accomplishments and chart a course for their administration for the years ahead. Biden is likely to celebrate passing the pandemic stimulus bill, which went through with zero Republican support. The president will also likely speak about the wave of executive actions he took in his early days of his term. The address will look different because of the pandemic and security concerns. A new report outlines the mistakes made by the Capitol Police on January 6th. It says the police force received key intelligence information ahead of the breach and should have been better prepared. Michael Bolton is the inspector general for the Capitol Police. The New York Times says it reviewed his latest report about how the force failed to properly prepare for January 6. Information released by the newspaper says Bolton's report details failures to respond to the intelligence reports about what to expect that day. The report explains that a Capitol Police intelligence assessment warned of potential violence three days ahead of the event, and it named Congress as the possible target. Bolton says the Department of Homeland Security passed on information about groups planning violence weeks ahead of time. Despite the warnings and intelligence, the report says police leaders ordered officers not to use their most powerful crowd control equipment and tactics. That's as a previous IG report said the department didn't prepare a comprehensive plan. The latest report states that police leadership didn't have an accurate roster of its civil disturbance unit. That unit was tasked with crowd control on January 6th, but the roster listed officers that didn't work there anymore. The report notes that equipment storage was also a problem. It says ammunition stored there had expired and riot shields weren't housed properly. This caused the shields to break easily. Bolton is scheduled to testify to Congress about his findings on Thursday. Three Republican senators want to remove a special rule favoring Major League Baseball. This follows the league's boycott of Georgia over the state's election integrity law. Senators Ted Cruz, Josh Hawley, and Mike Lee announce a bill to remove Major League Baseball's special status. We're here today to talk about legislation to remove the antitrust exemption that's long been enjoyed by Major League Baseball. Cruz explains why. What prompted this legislation being introduced was Major League Baseball's decision to pull the All-Star game out of Atlanta, Georgia. MLB Commissioner Robert Manfred Jr. says the league made the decision to demonstrate their values. He says the league fundamentally supports voting rights for all Americans and opposes restrictions to the ballot box. Cruz says the league decided to move the All-Star game based on a false narrative about the law. It did so based on a pile of lies. It did so based on an assertion that legislation the Georgia legislature took up to protect voter integrity somehow disenfranchised Georgia voters. The law requires voters to show ID to vote or request an absentee ballot, among other ballot integrity measures. Cruz says you even have to show an ID to pick up tickets at a professional baseball game. So Major League Baseball understands the value of identification and they apparently don't think they're being bigoted racist when they ask you for a driver's license to pick up your tickets. Hawley says the league can't expect to wield political influence and get government handouts at the same time. The three Republicans say they will sponsor the bill in the Senate. 
The U.S. Chamber of Commerce says it strongly opposes a Democratic-backed bill aimed at rewriting voting laws. It says the bill would punish corporations that engage in political advocacy. The bill in question is called the For the People Act. Democrats say it's needed to overcome Republican efforts to reform voting law. Many Republican-controlled state legislatures are exploring steps to increase election integrity. That's after multiple claims of election fraud in the November 2020 general election. The Chamber of Commerce said it wants more people involved in the political process, but the Democrat-backed bill would have precisely the opposite effect. It says the bill would push certain voices out of the political process altogether and that those voices represent large segments of the electorate and the American economy. The chamber says it's deeply troubled by the efforts to change election laws on a partisan basis. Undercover journalism nonprofit Project Veritas has just released new secretly recorded footage. The footage shows a CNN employee crediting the network for getting Trump out of office and talking about CNN's new focus now that COVID stories are becoming fatigued. James O'Keefe's Project Veritas has released new secretly recorded footage showing CNN technical director Charlie Chester detailing how the network worked to support President Biden during his 2020 election campaign. We would always show shots of him jogging and that I'm healthy, you know, blah, blah, blah. And him in aviator shades and like, a, like you paint him as a young geriatric. The montage of undercover clips were taken on several different occasions. And as with any clipped sound bites, the final product should be approached with caution. However, this video does show a number of Chester's complete sentences, making misleading editing tricks unlikely. In the video, Chester credits CNN for getting President Trump voted out of office and says that's why he came to work at CNN. He also admits the stories CNN ran about Trump's health amount to propaganda. Like when Trump uh, was, uh, I, I don't know, like his hand was shaking or whatever like that, we brought in like so many medical people to like all tell a story that like it was all speculation that he was like neurological damage, like that, that he was losing it, he's unfit to, you know, whatever. We were, we were creating a story there that we didn't know anything about, you know, we were, so that's, that's, I think that's probably it. The CNN employee said getting Trump out of office was CNN's focus. But now, he says, CNN has another focus, climate change. Chester indicated that the public is getting tired of virus-related stories and said climate change is going to be the next COVID. So it's going to be our focus. Like, uh, like our, our focus was to get Trump out of office, right? Without saying it, that's what it was, right? So our next thing is going to be for climate change. He said this decision came from the head of the network and that it's already been announced to employees. As technical director, Chester wouldn't have input on show content and he was likely not included in editorial meetings. However, in a statement to Mediate, O'Keefe said, as a technical director, Charlie Chester is fully involved in the day-to-day -day operations of CNN's newsroom. He is witness to decisions being made and who they are coming from. He has full access to the culture within the network and explains on video how company-wide directives are being implemented. O'Keefe says this video is only part one, indicating there's more to come. A new group formed by former senior aides to President Donald Trump launched on Tuesday. Its goal is to permanently fuse the former president's America First agenda with the Republican Party. The nonprofit is called the America First Policy Institute and has a staff of 35 former Trump aides. They include former cabinet secretaries, top national security advisors, and members of the former president's evangelical advisory board. It plans to have an office in the Washington suburb of Arlington, Virginia. It has an initial budget of $20 million, but plans to double that before the 2022 midterm elections. In a statement Tuesday, Trump said the group's members have his full support and he looks forward to working with them. Up next, two taxi drivers file a class action lawsuit against New York City for over $2.5 billion. They say they're frustrated over impossibly high fees they paid for the right to operate the yellow cabs. And businesses in New York City have struggled to survive even as the pandemic wanes. But a green market in the city's Union Square neighborhood is helping to inspire hope. Find out more in just a minute. Officials say six people were rescued and a dozen others are still missing off the coast of Louisiana. That's after a commercial boat capsized in the Gulf of Mexico. 
The Coast Guard says it got a distress call Tuesday afternoon. An urgent marine information broadcast was aired. Multiple Good Samaritan boat crews responded and joined Coast Guard in the rescue operation. The almost 130-foot power lift boat that capsized is used for oil and gas exploration. The National Weather Service in New Orleans had issued a special marine warning Tuesday about the steep waves in the region. It advised people there to seek safe harbor and take protective actions. Most of the CCP virus cases in New York City are new variants of the virus. NTD's Arian Pastar asks an expert what this means for the fight against the virus. As much as 70% of all new cases in the city are new variants. Some of those are the well-known UK or Brazilian variant. But the most prevalent one was first discovered in Washington Heights. City officials are calling it the Washington Heights variant. Now all of those new variants have different categorizations. For example, the Washington Heights variant is called a variant of interest by the CDC because it spreads faster than the original strain. But the UK variant, on the other hand, not only spreads faster, but it also causes more severe symptoms, so it's a variant of concern. Viruses are always evolving, so the prevalence of new variants is no surprise. These COVID viruses are going to be around, just like flu viruses, and we're always going to get some modification or different components of this. New York is trying to get ahead of those variants. So the state is vaccinating everyone over 16 years of age now. According to Dr. Samadi, we should go back to only vaccinating the vulnerable population. And if you just randomly talk about that everybody out there should get vaccinated, including children, then what do you need any science or data or research for? According to a new report from the city, New York will continue studying the Washington Heights variant to see if it poses a significant threat. Arian Pastar, NTD News, New York. New York City taxi drivers need to buy medallions from the government in order to do their jobs. But drivers are suing, saying the government artificially inflated medallion prices as Uber and Lyft devastated their industry. Two taxi drivers have filed a $2.56 billion lawsuit accusing New York City officials of artificially inflating the value of its taxi medallions by fraudulent, collusive and deceptive means in order to maximize its own profits. State Senator Tim Kennedy discussed the situation last month. New York City medallions were worth in the past over a million dollars. Today, Many of those are valued at under $200,000, leaving these medallion owners who are often immigrants with hefty debt that they can't repay. The medallions give drivers the right to pick up customers. Former president and current spokesman of the New York State Federation of Taxi Drivers, Fernando Mateo, applauds the suit. So the person who sold it to them should take them back and give them their money back and sell them at today's price. That's what's fair. The plaintiffs claim New York City earned approximately $855 million from high-priced medallion sales, knowing full well that Uber and Lyft made them far less valuable. Drivers can't afford to lose their livelihood, to lose everything that they've saved in their life for and everything that they've worked for. So shame on New York City for taking the cab drivers on a ride. Mayor de Blasio has taken action to address the situation, setting up a relief fund and giving out $20,000 loans. So they can end up in a better situation for their future and for their family's future. Mateo, who is running for mayor, says this is not enough. It's a slap in the face to hear what he is offering these drivers. It's adding insult to injury. You don't do that. If I am mayor, when I am mayor, I will make sure that these drivers get their money back. The plaintiff's lawyer says the city owes medallion owners three times the $855 million revenue, according to federal racketeering law. Colin Fredrickson, NTD News. New York is eager to bounce back from a year of pandemic lockdowns and economic struggle. And one outdoor market in the city's Union Square neighborhood is helping the borough do just that. Locals say it's inspiring hope. Andrew's honey founder, Andrew Cote, tends to his beehives on the rooftop of a 38-story residential building in Manhattan. The cityscape rises in the background behind him. Cote has over 60 beehives on rooftops and in community gardens throughout New York City. 
the two boxes behind me, that's for the bees. It's all for the bees. So it's, if it's brood, if it's pollen, if it's honey, that's for the bees. I'll add a third box, usually a, a shorter one called a medium or maybe called a shallow, and that honey will be for us to harvest. After the bees make enough honey for Cote to harvest, usually in July and September, some of that sweet liquid gold is sold at his stand at the Union Square Green Market. At the market, Cote said Andrew's honey had its best sales day in 13 months in late March. But sales have only begun to recover and return to pre-pandemic levels. Things are, are better than they were. Uh, sales now compared to one year ago are better but they're nowhere near the two year ago mark yet. But we, uh, we're, we're hopeful. Tenzin Takme, manager of Norwich Meadows Farm, said his produce stand needs more than happy thoughts. I hope it's not enough. People need to like, you know, come out and do the right thing, you know? I know you have to follow the uh, safety features, whatever the rules are, but I think it's important for them to come out and Talkmay said the farm sales at the green market during the pandemic year were dismal. It's been terrible. Uh, uh, comparing to this month, to the past, uh, this month is much better. Like we are like doing a little better than the past 12 months. It was really hard for us to get through. But even though the pandemic caused setbacks, Jennifer Falk, executive director at Union Square Partnership, said that the green market was the busiest place in the neighborhood. The Union Square area, just like all other commercial districts, um, suffered um, from the pandemic, but some of the key advantages of the neighborhood helped to see us through the crisis. And the green market is the number one foot traffic driver in the neighborhood. Falk said more than 30 businesses have opened or plan to open in the district since January 2020. Pre-pandemic, she said 40 new businesses usually open in the Union Square neighborhood each year. But Falk said the Union Square Green Market is inspiring hope for the district. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. And just ahead, San Francisco plans to pilot a drug sobering center. They say its 24-hour facility can help lower drug addiction and overdoses and aid recovery. Beloved Los Angeles movie theater, the Cinerama Dome, is closing. The news sent shock through Hollywood. Some hope the theater can be saved. Stay tuned to find out more. When the game's over and it's time to go home, sometimes your car has other plans. That's why I drive with Car Shield. As expensive as car repairs can be, I wanted the best defense around. And with Car Shield's administrators, they make sure that you don't get stuck with expensive car repairs like this. Did I forget to mention that with Car Shield's network, I also get 24 7 roadside assistance, towing, and rental car reimbursement included. That's peace of mind every driver needs. I saved close to $9,000. If it wasn't for Car Shields, I wouldn't have my car. I got to tell you, it's quite a relief not to worry about expensive car breakdowns anymore. And with Car Shields administrators, you can choose your favorite mechanic or dealer to do the work. Plus, it's easier than ever to get America's favorite car protection. There's no long term contracts, and coverage is affordable for every wallet size. If I didn't have Car Shield, I would have been out of pocket $7,000. And as a parent of three, I couldn't have that. I trust Car Shield administrators because they paid my claim. Talk about MVP protection for less than the cost of a ball game. Take it from me, the boomer. Nobody wants to go through the headache of an expensive car breakdown on their own. If you're driving without a warranty, you have to call Car Shield. Yeah, you do. So do yourself and your car a favor. Call Car Shield. They're your best line of defense against expensive breakdowns. Car Shield administrators paid almost $4,000 for my repairs. Car Shield is wonderful. They saved me $1,300. With Car Shield, I saved $4,100 on my first repair. Over a million happy drivers couldn't be wrong. Call Car Shield now. Protect yourself now against expensive auto repair bills. Call Car Shield for a free and instant protection plan quote. Once your car breaks down, it's too late. Call 800-781-2990, 800-781-2990. The head of the IRS says the government is losing some $1 trillion in unpaid taxes every year.
The IRS is asking Congress for more funding to help with the situation. Commissioner Charles Reddick told the Senate Finance Committee that the gap between taxes owed and taxes that are paid is growing. The last official estimate from 2011 to 2013 was an annual average of $441 billion in uncollected taxes. Now the number is up to or even surpassing $1 trillion. Reddick says that could be because people have new sources of making money that escape taxation. Some examples are cryptocurrency trading, foreign sourced income, and abuses of business income passed through as personal income. And Reddick says the agency has 17,000 fewer revenue enforcement staff than a decade ago due to budget cuts. They're also outgunned by increasingly sophisticated tax avoidance schemes. San Francisco officials say they plan to open a sobering center as part of a pilot program. The center would allow people to sober up while intoxicated with drugs. San Francisco Mayor London Breed announced a lease for a drug sobering center on Howard Street. It's for people intoxicated from fentanyl, meth, and other drugs. According to Tuesday's press release, the center is meant to prevent overdose deaths and reduce danger to the surrounding neighborhood, and to give people who use drugs an alternative to hospital and jail stays. Breed will propose the building lease to the city's board of supervisors. The facility will initially be able to serve up to 20 people at a time, operating 24-7. People may stay an average of 8 to 10 hours each. Healthcare and safety workers will staff the program. According to the San Francisco Chronicle, the project would cost $2 million in one-time expenses and $4.2 million to operate annually. If the city's Board of Supervisors approves the building lease, the pilot program could be implemented this fall. Police arrest a longtime suspect for the disappearance of 19-year-old college freshman Kristen Smart. Smart went missing 25 years ago, and her body still hasn't been found. She was declared legally dead in 2002. On Tuesday morning, 44-year-old Paul Flores was arrested in the Los Angeles area on suspicion of murder, and he's being held without bail. His 80-year-old father was also booked in jail for being an accessory to the crime, with a bail set at $250,000. Flores was a classmate of Smart and has long been the main suspect in her disappearance. Smart vanished in May 1996 after walking to her dorm at California Polytechnic State University after an off-campus party. She was last seen alive with Flores, who offered to take her home. Smart's family issued a statement saying this was a bittersweet day they'd been waiting for and a first step toward bringing their daughter home. Two California leaders are facing sexual assault allegations. One is a former mayor who has been arrested without bail. The other is a current mayor facing recalls by local residents. NTD's David Lamb has the story. On Saturday, police officers arrested former Sebastopol Mayor Robert Jacob and took him into custody without bail. Jacob is facing an investigation of five felonies, including distribution of child pornography and one misdemeanor sexual assault crime against a minor. According to Sebastopol Police Chief Kevin Gilgore, the alleged assaults occurred between December 2019 and March 2021. Jacob was the CEO of two large marijuana dispensaries in California and was the first marijuana business executive elected as a U.S. mayor in 2013. His career even earned him the nickname the cannabis mayor in the industry. The current mayor of Sebastopol, Una Glass, called the arrest of his predecessor extremely disappointing. And just miles away, Windsor's mayor Dominic Fapoli is also facing allegations of sexual assault from six women, including a French intern at his family-owned winery. One of the allegations dates back to 2003. But Fapoli has denied all accusations and called them political and social machinations. Local residents and officials are campaigning to recall Fapoli. Two California representatives called on Fapoli to resign and say the allegations suggest a pattern of predatory behavior. His chief political ally, Council Mayor Deborah Fudge, also called for his removal. The state's attorney general will oversee the investigation into Fapoli. David Lamb, NTD News, California. One of Los Angeles' best-known movie theaters is closing for good. Locals say they're heartbroken and concerned for the fate of other theaters forced to close during the pandemic. Once a bustling spot for movie stars and moviegoers alike, Los Angeles' famed Cinerama Dome is shutting down for good. 
Pacific Theaters confirmed earlier this week it would be permanently closing the Dome's home, Arclight Hollywood, as well as 15 other cinemas across the city. It's another major blow to the movie industry as a result of the global health crisis. As a staple of the L.A. film scene for over 50 years, the Dome has hosted glamorous movie premieres and red carpet events. It's also every local's go-to place to watch a movie. I was really heartbroken. There's a lot of things that have closed in this neighborhood in the last year, but this is one that I really was hoping would come back. It's almost a sacred place, I think, to people here, where it not only would show the blockbuster tent poles, but it would show independent films that you couldn't find anywhere else. Um, you're, really, you're really connected with other film lovers there. Like It's just such an iconic theater that we really love going to, and yeah, so it's heartbreaking. That's why we came down today, just to like look at it and take some photos of it, just to see it. Celebrities like Lord of the Rings star Elijah Wood and Crazy Rich Asians director John Chu have taken to social media in shock and sorrow about the Dome's closure. The Dome was declared a historic monument in 1998 and features in everything from the soap opera Melrose Place to Quentin Tarantino's blockbuster Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Many are even calling on celebrities like Tarantino and Brad Pitt to buy the theater and save it from closure. In a statement, Pacific Theaters thanked its employees for their service, as well as the many guests and members of the film industry who have, quote, made going to the movies such a magical experience over the years. Coming up, the Epic Times provides more details about the attack on its Hong Kong printing press. The D.C. press conference comes after masked men broke in and destroyed equipment on April 12th. The U.S. Navy took a photograph of a Chinese aircraft carrier in the East China Sea. The reason? Apparently to warn China that the U.S. is watching. All that and more on NTD News. U.S. lawmakers are condemning the April 12th attack on the Epic Times print shop in Hong Kong. The newspaper provided more details about the incident. In Washington, D.C., the director of the Epic Times Hong Kong edition gave new details on the attack. As soon as the attackers barged into the printing plant, they threatened the staff, telling them not to do anything that would force the attackers to take action. They caused extensive damage to the printing equipment. The printing press control panel sustained the most severe damage, while the transmitter, several computers and a CPU were also destroyed. The Epic Times also released footage that shows four masked men breaking into the printing house. They smashed computers and printing machinery and threw concrete rubble onto the printing equipment. Guo Jun said the attack is not an isolated incident. This attack is not an isolated incident. It's the fifth time since its establishment in 2006 that criminals have targeted the printing press. Since last October, staff at the printing press have been monitored and followed by unknown vehicles. She says the same facility was attacked in November 2019. That's when four masked men broke in and set fire to the building. There was also another attack back in October 2012. Thugs tried to smash open the gate to the facility. Two months later, seven men carrying toolboxes attempted to break into the facility, but fled after being discovered by security guards. Founded in the United States in 2000, the Epic Times began publishing in Hong Kong in 2001. The Chinese Communist Party has used every trick in the book to suppress the Epic Times in Hong Kong in an attempt to prevent the city's people from getting independent news. The Epic Times is one of the few remaining voices in the Hong Kong media landscape that does not bend to the CCP. The attack on free press has gained increasing attention from U.S. lawmakers. The director thanked the international community for its support. She said Hong Kong Epic Times will never bow to the Chinese Communist Party and will continue reporting the truth. The Hong Kong Epic Times office has suspended its printing operations due to the damage. But Guo Jun says staff are in the process of repairing the equipment. She expects to start printing again by April 16th. UK and EU politicians and organizations also condemn the attack on the Epic Times printing press in Hong Kong. Members of the UK Parliament's upper house responded to the news of the attack on one of Hong Kong's independent media. 
Lord Hunt of King's Heath said he was very shocked to hear this. The Epoch Times is an amazing independent media outlet in Hong Kong, fearless and standing up for a free press and human rights. May its voice never be silenced. Lord Alton of Liverpool said, Those who become enemies of freedom of speech, who smash up printing presses or threaten journalists, have no respect for human rights and show their fear of truth. Paradoxically, their use of violence, intimidation and brute force reveals their weakness and the nature of their ideology. And Baroness Kennedy of the Shores said, Freedom of the press is fundamental to a democracy. Crushing the media and independent journalism is a way to deny citizens information about abuses of power and about the loss of their rights. Wrecking computers and printing equipment is the act of those who despise democracy. London-based writer and human rights activist, who is also the chief executive and co-founder of Hong Kong Watch, Benedict Rogers, commented that This attack on the Epoch Times is yet another deplorable example of increasing threats to media freedom and freedom of expression in Hong Kong and should be condemned unequivocally. An international cross-party group of lawmakers, the Interparliamentary Alliance on China, said The freedom of press is an absolute requirement in any state that respects the rule of law. If the Hong Kong authorities really were independent champions of their democratic system, they'd defend the Epoch Times. Hong Kong has slipped into the grips of an authoritarian communist party that will tolerate no criticism. China's aggression towards Taiwan continues to increase as a record-breaking 25 Chinese military jets entered Taiwan's air zone. Meanwhile, in the East China Sea, the U.S. Navy sent a message that they are keeping an eye on Chinese activity. NTD's Tiffany Meyer brings us more on the story. In its largest air incursion to date, China's aggression towards Taiwan shows no sign of easing. On Monday, a record-breaking 25 Chinese military aircraft entered the island's airspace. Taiwan's defense ministry reported fighter jets and nuclear-capable bombers among the planes in the incursion. As part of its One China policy, Beijing claims Taiwan as part of its own territory. It has not shied away from the possibility of unifying the island with mainland China by force. The unparalleled incursion comes after new U.S.-Taiwan policies. On Friday, the U.S. State Department issued fresh guidelines that will enable American officials to meet more freely with their Taiwanese counterparts. In light of the guidelines, China's foreign ministry issued a stern warning on Tuesday. The ministry spokesman told the U.S. to grasp the weight of the situation in regards to Taiwan and warned the White House not to play with fire. He went as far as to call the One China policy the foundation of U.S.-China relations. China's incursion into Taiwan also came despite a warning from the U.S. just one day prior. On Sunday, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken warned that it would be a serious mistake for China to change the status quo in reference to Taiwan. The U.S. has released a bold photo message to China, seemingly warning the country's navy not to step out of line. Over the weekend, the U.S. published a photo showing that the U.S. Navy is keeping an eye on a Chinese aircraft carrier. The image was taken last week, somewhere in the East China Sea. It captures a U.S.-guided missile destroyer, the USS Mustin, just a few thousand yards or meters away from Chinese aircraft carrier Liaoning. Analysts say the photo was designed to send a clear message to Beijing. The USS Mustin's commander, Briggs, is seen relaxing with his feet up, with his deputy sitting beside him, both watching the Chinese Liaoning ship. A former Taiwan's Naval Academy instructor called the staged photo cognitive warfare, adding that the image means the U.S. isn't taking Chinese aggression lightly. A professional photographer notices the commander Briggs is using a Steiner telescope in the photo. On the scope, the company's logo, Nothing Escapes You, is visible. China reacted quickly to the message. The Chinese Communist Party's media mouthpiece released a video showing Navy live fire drills. The video explained that intensive Navy training is being conducted across three major war zones in China. The chief editor of a Chinese state-run newspaper, Hu Xijing, posted an update soon after on Chinese social media platform Weibo. He boasted that the Chinese regime would drive U.S. troops over 900 miles offshore during war. Still to come, questions remain about safety protocols as the Tokyo Olympic Games approach. Japan is holding test events to see if its new regulations are practical. If you're like me, and I think it's actually most of us, then you're getting really fed up with the nonsense 
going on inside the banking system. I mean, we've worked hard our entire lives to retire comfortably. We just recovered from the crash of 2008, and it seems like it's about to happen all over again. Look at the too big to fail banks. They're only getting bigger as the Fed hands them trillions of dollars daily, while simple folks like you and me, we're only getting the short end of the stick. That's why I'm glad I found this book called The Bank Failure Survival Guide. Give us a call and we'll send you a free copy with no obligations whatsoever. Just one American to another, telling you about some options that you might not have considered. Call 866-239-2619 today for your free copy of The Bank Failure Survival Guide. That's 866-239-2619. We can't control political volatility, inflation, massive government debt, or the wild swings of the stock market. But we can control where we put our money. Gold is easily outperforming the stock market the last 20 years. Protect your money. Buy gold. For your free direct bullion guide to buying gold, call 1-800-757-7050. During the 2008 recession, Americans lost over $2 trillion from their 401ks. For many people, retirement was no longer an option. But do you know what tried and true investment nearly doubled its value following the recession? Gold. Protect your money. Buy gold. For your free direct bullion guide to buying gold, call 1-800-757-7050. Start your collection today. The countdown to the Tokyo Olympics hits the 100-day mark, with the Games finally drawing closer to reality after a one-year delay due to the pandemic. But there are still a few unanswered questions. The countdown is on for the Tokyo Olympics. The Games are scheduled for July 23rd to August 8th, and the Paralympics from August 24th to September the 5th. The one-year delay has already brought with it plenty of complications. And there are still some unanswered questions regarding things like spectator numbers and the so-called playbooks. Some 11,000 Olympic athletes will compete in 33 sports, while over 4,000 Paralympians will compete across 22 sports. But with Japan's elderly population only just starting to receive inoculations, there will be a need for restrictions still. International spectators will not be allowed. Organizers plan to decide in April on the maximum number of local fans permitted in venues. Japanese sports arenas have been recently operating at up to 50% capacity. Are athletes required to be vaccinated? The simple answer is no, but the International Olympic Committee urges them to be vaccinated once vaccinations are made available to the general population of their countries. Participants must follow the health guidelines in their playbook. What is it? First unveiled in February, the playbooks outline the rules that all Games participants must follow. That includes mandatory mask wearing, keeping two metres distance from other athletes and clapping instead of singing or shouting to show support. Athletes will also be tested at least once every four days. And I had no hesitation in saying that the Games will take place and they'll be the safest Games possible. Japan is holding several test events seen as dress rehearsals to confirm the Games' operational capabilities at venues and test out health protocols. Early May will see four such events with athletes coming from abroad. There will be no shortage of compelling action once the Games kick off. Four sports will debut at this year's Olympics. Karate, sport climbing, surfing and skateboarding. Several stars from French judoka Teddy Rina to American swimmer Katie Ledecky will be back in the quest for more gold. <laughs> Japanese swimmer Rikako Ike competing after her recovery from leukemia will no doubt be among the most emotional moments of the Games. Over to Europe. It's National Scrabble Day in England. The game put on a colorful light show in London to celebrate with words that reflect the mood of the British people. Some of Britain's favorite words were projected onto buildings around London. They marked the easing of lockdown restrictions and National Scrabble Day on Tuesday. Words like freedom, hope, family, reunion and beer represent the mood of the nation. 
They were beamed in the style of the game's letter tiles onto a pub, shops, and special places like Harrods Department Store and the Shard Skyscraper. Scrabble commissioned a survey to find the words that best sum up people's feelings as months of lockdown eased on Monday. The most powerful word in there for me is reunion. Um, we've all been apart from each other, um, friends, loved ones, um, colleagues <laughs> who are also loved ones, I suppose, <laughs> in some cases, um, and really looking forward to getting back to my friends and family that I haven't seen for a long time, and imagine a lot of the British public are too. The game that would eventually be called Scrabble was invented in New York by Alfred Mosher Butts, an architect during the Depression. National Scrabble Day is celebrated on his birthday. The game is played in more than 120 countries in 33 languages. Scrabble said lockdown had boosted sales of the game in Britain by more than 50% in 2020. One of the world's biggest bunnies is missing. Police say he was snatched from his pen in central England. Darius is a continental giant rabbit and has held the Guinness World Record for the world's longest rabbit since 2010. He lives in a backyard enclosure in the village of Stalton, England. But local police say he didn't escape on his own. They're now appealing for information on the extra-large critter, who is gray-brown and over four feet long at full stretch. Owner Annette Edwards, a rabbit breeder and model, first posted an over $1,300 reward for his safe return, but she later boosted it to over $2,700 in a desperate tweet on Tuesday, imploring his captors to please bring him back. She says the rabbit is now too old for breeding. Up next, people trying to lose pounds after quarantines and lockdowns bet on their weight loss. Proponents and detractors weigh in on the gamble. Stay tuned to find out more. Many have put on the quarantine 15 over the past year and are looking for ways to lose unwanted lockdown weight. Some are even betting on it. NTD's Andrew Thomas has the story. 36-year-old Miranda Broomfield from Greenwood, Indiana is a loving wife and mother. But in 2018, she became determined to look after herself more. She discovered Healthy Wage online, where you can bet on yourself losing weight. She put down between $50 and $1,200 every month and gave herself an initial period of 18 months to lose the pounds. In a chance, it's, it's a gamble, but it's you're in total control of it. When you go to gamble, you know, at a casino or on the slot machines, you don't have control. After you put your money in or your money down, you don't control that, that those odds. With healthy wage, you're in complete control. After continuing for another six months, she finally reached her goal weight, three days before her birthday in May 2020. David Roddenberry, who has a master's degree in health policy, launched Healthy Wage in 2009 with his colleague, Jimmy Fleming. In the past 12 months, Roddenberry says the company has paid out approximately $17 million to people who met their weight loss goals. We're not trying to be your sole weight loss solution. Um, we are a complement to other things. So we're, we don't provide you with a comprehensive diet plan or we don't send food to your house. Um, we're the motivation piece on top of what you're doing. But not everyone is convinced that betting on yourself is a sustainable long-term goal. Some worry about swapping one addiction for another, in this case, food for gambling. Oftentimes, addiction is addiction is addiction, whether it's shopping, food, exercise, alcohol, it all stimulates the same kind of chemicals in the brain. And so if we're just sh jumping around from one behavior to another, we are going to continue to have an addiction cycle. Kitley says while the program is a good initial step for weight loss, the root cause of weight issues still needs to be addressed. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. Let's turn our attention to health and well-being now by looking at six common sleep positions. One study says the position you sleep in can tell your personality type and can also affect your health. Sleeping is a wonderful function of nature that helps to restore the immune system. It also restores the muscular, skeletal and nervous systems of our bodies. According to experts, which position one chooses to sleep in is linked to our health and our personality type. Professor Chris Idzikowski is the director of the Sleep Assessment and Advisory Service. He conducted experiments with 1,000 sleeping subjects and analyzed six of the most common sleeping positions. 
The study yielded some interesting results. Let's look at the position, the personality type, and the pros and cons from a health perspective. Number one, the fetal position. This is the most common sleeping position. One curls up while lying on one side. 41% of the subjects in the study preferred sleeping like this. This posture may reflect a tough exterior, but also reveal a soft and sensitive heart. Those who sleep like this may take some time to warm up to others, but prove to be warm and relaxed once they do. If this is your sleeping posture of choice, it is preferred to sleep on your right side as sleeping on your left side will put pressure on your vital organs, including your liver, stomach, and lungs. Number two, the free fall position. This posture involves lying stomach down, arms holding the pillow with the head facing to the side. The tummy down pose may reveal an expressive personality. Although such persons may be brash and seem full of confidence on the outside, they may actually be vulnerable to slights. Stomach down sleeping postures are generally beneficial for the digestive system. Number three, the log position. One lies on one side with arms at one side. Those who prefer this position are agreeable, though they have a tendency to be overly trusting and gullible, and this may lead them to be taken advantage of. The log position is excellent for the spine and relieves back pain. Number four, the yearner. One lies on one side with both arms extended in front of the body. Those who sleep in this position are willing to try new things, but can also be apprehensive and indecisive. Once they have made a decision, however, they tend to stick with it. Sleeping on one side can help prevent stomach acid reflux and soothe sleep apnea. Number five, the soldier position. One lies flat on one's back with both arms at one side. People who choose the soldier sleeping pose may be the strong silent type. They often hold themselves and others to high standards in life. According to studies, sleeping on one's back can lead to snoring and poor sleeping. Number six, the starfish position. One lies on one's back with both arms raised. If the starfish position is your preferred sleeping position, you may be a good listener and successful at maintaining friendships. Such persons tend to not like being the center of attention. This position may also lead to snoring and respiration problems. Illegal drugs coming from China through Mexico and into the U.S. take the lives of hundreds of people every day. And it's not only from substance abuse, but also unsuspecting Americans buying what they think are prescription pills, but that really contain a deadly poison. NTD's Kay Rubicek has the story. Treatment's important, but you can't treat somebody in the morgue. There's a lethal partnership between the Chinese and the Mexican cartels. They operate in probably almost every city in this country. We have to call it what it is. Congress, let's go. Step it up. That's murder, in my opinion. In February this year, a large-scale active heroin mill was found and dismantled in this apartment building in Queens, New York, right down the road from an elementary school. Millions of dollars of narcotics were confiscated, including 1,000 pills that looked like prescription pills, but were actually laced with deadly fentanyl. Just those pills alone could have killed 1,000 unsuspecting New Yorkers who might have thought they were buying a legitimate painkiller. So to understand exactly where these drugs are coming from and how they get into communities just like this one, we sat down for an in-depth interview with Derek Molks, the former DEA agent in charge of the Drug Administration's Special Operations Division. And he gives us a show and tell of the flow of drugs, cash and chemicals coming in across the USA and what we can do about it. We have a record-breaking, unprecedented crisis with deaths from counterfeit pills and from drugs. There's a lethal partnership between the Chinese and the Mexican cartels. In the laboratories in China, they have like 160,000 chemical companies. When they send these chemicals to Mexico, to the cartels, and the cartels can produce seven tons of meth in three days, as an example, and then this stuff comes into the US, right? Our people are dying from those drugs every single day. They've always had big leadership people operating in New York, all over Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, right? Tennessee, all of these cities and, and, and states would be getting supplied by Atlanta. 
They started using even Atlanta to get stuff up into New York, New Jersey, Baltimore. Chicago has always been like an epicenter of all the command and control for these cartels because they have the ability to send drugs directly to Los Angeles, to Chicago. Then it goes up into Canada, it goes over to St. Louis, it goes over to Milwaukee. You know, the routes are constantly changing. You may have now cartels that actually go right into Boston Airport. And then in Boston, up to New Hampshire, Maine, Vermont, they can set up in, let's say, Seattle. So you still may have the loads coming through LA, up to Seattle, then they'll send it over into Vancouver. And that's really alarming to America's national security. Watch the full episode of Life and Times every week on NTD Television. And that's all for now. Catch us again tonight at 6.30 Eastern. I'm Kevin Hogan. We have a new channel. Subscribe to us on YouTube at NTD News. Get the highlights of our news broadcast and the most important headlines that we curate especially for you. Don't miss out on important news. Our videos are being deleted. So if you don't want to be cut off from honest news, take a moment to sign up for our newsletter at newsletter.ntd.com so you don't lose access to NTD. Go to newsletter.ntd.com to sign up for our evening newsletter.